cheers to the beginning of another class. That's actually not a six and a half gallon mug. Camera perspective, that's how they did most of the Hobbit shots in uh, Lord of the Rings, if you've seen it. That used to be a really contemporary reference, but like a lot of my references over the years, they've gotten kind of dated. Uh, I'm old enough now that a lot of my music references are classic ones. It's kind of rough. I'm kind of up on the stuff happening now, but I'm, you know, I've got my personal favorites and they're mostly old. Or what you would think of as old, anyway. Hope you're all doing well, wherever you're at. In an apartment, on a beach, in a bunker, I myself am in. What looks like either a bunker or a storage closet, but is actually a very small library in a local church. Uh, Much thanks to Emmaus Lutheran Church for letting me use their library. I am a member here. They didn't just give me the room. I didn't randomly run into somebody on the street and get a key. Uh, I have to say, it's a little strange to be recording something like this in basically an empty church building. It feels like I'm in a George Romero movie and there are going to be zombies outside pounding on the door any minute. Uh, Hopefully not. Hopefully COVID-19 won't get to zombie apocalypse point. Although we do have so many zombie movies now that if it did, I think we could all be pretty well informed about what to do. So today's lecture is going to be dealing a little bit more with the sort of the central ideas of the course. It's not going to be super long. I, as I've mentioned before, I try to keep these between 10 and 15 minutes at the most, um, partially because I don't think anyone can really pay attention to an educational video for more than that, about 10 or 15 minutes without some kind of special effects or helicopter crane shots, something. Um, the idea of the course, as I mentioned in the syllabus or in the introductory video as well, is simple enough. Uh, we have historical traumas, uh, moments like the Holocaust, the Andalusian Rebellion, uh, the Bubonic Plague. We will not be studying the plague itself, but we will be studying its fictional representation. Um, and ask our question, why, why do works of art even want to deal with these things? What's to be gained from them? Today, what we're going to be talking about a little bit more is how we engage these things where we're at. Um, in, in other moments in history, particularly when most of these were written, a lot of these artistic forms were things you had to study in an educational institution. Uh, du Fu, for example, or the Chinese poet that we will start the course with next week, um, had a lot of training, was a master of the craft, and you didn't just pick up a book of Du Fu then or now. Um, and it was a very specialized skill, so specialized that at least in, Chi- in Chinese history up until the Song Dynasty, which was, well, long enough ago that, you know, a thousand or so years ago, I can give you specific dates if you want, but um, for several thousand years anyway, poetry was a key part of the civil service exams. So if you wanted to get a job, basically the job that didn't suck, which for most of Chinese history was in the government somewhere, even if it was just regional government, you had to pass this big time exam. It worked a little like the NCAA bracket, you know, where you start out here, you take this sort of provincial exam, and then you take this exam, and then eventually, if you're good enough, you make it to the the central imperial exam. Hooray. But for most of the of Chinese history, it was either based in poetry, you, you had to be able to demonstrate that you could both interpret and write poetry. Anyway, those skills have sort of died out over the years, and we're in a very specialized place now. Um, I don't intend to just trot out the old chestnuts like, oh, with the internet, you know, you can access too much information. No one knows what they're reading anymore. Uh, We're going to look at why that's kind of funny to say that. Uh, And then we'll set out what exactly we're going to be doing with these works of art. Uh, So let's begin. By the way, I should mention it's it's really a shame I can't just do some sort of actual film. Uh, PowerPoints in in a presentation like this are not my favorite, but sort of constrained by time and technology. So we're going to go simple here. So two of the most important breakthroughs in how we experience art and literature, and really anything for that matter, before the creation of the internet, both occurred in the early 19th century. I should mention methodologically also before we go too much further. I'm not going to read every word on every slide. 
Uh, partially because if I did that, you could easily make the case, why am I doing it at all? We'll just read it on our own. But also, because there are going to be a lot of things uh, that I want to say apart from that, this is meant sort of as a way, if you, if you have a hard time understanding me, this will give you a good thumbnail for what you should be getting out of it. So, the first big thing was the creation of lithography, 1796, which I mentioned in a parenthesis there. Yes, I'm aware that's not the 19th century. But it was created then and then became a thing much later. So I'm not going to go into the whole technology of how lithography works. Um, but basically, it allowed for you to make thousands and thousands of reproductions of something. Not, not just print, anything. Uh, images, maps, just about anything you can think of that can be put onto paper was, was reproduced lithographically. Um, and it became a big deal, especially in the publishing industry in the mid-19th century. And we'll see why in a minute. But the second big thing was the founding of Penny Press Journalism by Émile Girardin and his popular periodical, La Presse. I forgot to put the E on the end of that. I thought I had. I went back and edited this and put the E on. It must not have saved. Anyway, not that I'm sure you care. But as a French speaker, that's, that's kind of annoying. 1836. Now... Here's what happened with this. In the early part of the 19th century, the French government kind of waffled back and forth about, okay, so are we supposed to really control all the stuff that's being published or not? And depending on the tide of the press, whether it was for or against the government, uh, you could publish whatever you want or not. The high watermark for publishing in France until the 20th century were the few years before the French Revolution in 1789 when there was just an absolute explosion because everyone had something to say and they didn't mind just printing a cheap piece of paper to put it on. Now, by the time Émile Girardin and La Presse came into uh, existence, well, not Girardin, he, he, he existed before, obviously, but La Presse, anyway, there was a huge restriction, uh, tax, anyway, on postage. Right? So how do, how do you get your stuff mailed out if you're going to pay a mint on postage? Well, Girardin's solution was, well, look, I'm not going to pay it myself. Advertisers will pay me to put their stuff in my paper. Sounds familiar now. In 1836, it was an absolute revolution. No one had even thought of this before. Partly because if you were going to print something and distribute it and it had your thoughts in writing, you would, didn't want to cheapen it by putting ads in it. Right? That would just be really sad and pathetic. Except Girardin rather logically, rationally decided, yeah, it may sound kind of lame, but what's even lamer than that is going broke putting out a paper. So he did that. Ads go in and prices dropped. Uh, he's one of the first to start distributing a periodical on a mass scale. Hundreds of thousands of people just in Paris by the 1850s were buying this newspaper every single day. Now, this did a few things at the same time. Now, in some of these, you can probably guess. Uh, but first, obviously, tons of people who'd never been able to afford to read something before now could. Not everyone could just walk into a bookstore and buy some leather-bound folio. You had to have a lot of money for that. Well, when a newspaper costs the equivalent of about two cents, pretty much anybody can, right? Uh, and not surprisingly, because there are so many new readers, you get new genres like science fiction. Um, the detective novel comes about largely because publishers start going, well, hang on a second. If everyone's buying this, there's it's, it's so cheap, we can sort of cater to whatever market we want. And there's all these construction workers, or industrial workers at the time, rather, who have scientific knowledge, industrial knowledge. Maybe they'd like to read a story about industry. And that's where we get science fiction from. Now, the other big part of this, uh, and this is a little more abstract, was for the first time, you could publish at the pace of life. For the first time, something could happen just out in the city, out in the countryside even, and even sometimes by that evening, you could read about it. Uh, in some cases, you could even see a picture of it. So whereas before, if you wanted to read about an event, it would probably take a couple of years or even decades for someone to write a long book about it, and then have it published, and then have it distributed. It could take a long time, and by then, the memory would have faded or just forgotten altogether. 
Uh, but with this kind of printing here, something could be distributed and the people reading it possibly were even there, right? Now with this comes a kind of feedback loop. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Terry Pratchett, uh, one of the 20th century's genius writers. Uh, he wrote, uh, what would we call it? Not really fantasy or science fiction. Um, a lot of satire, but also very, very serious at the same time. Definitely check him out if you haven't. He writes a novel called The Truth about the creation of the newspaper in this fictional realm he's created called Ankh Morpork. I don't know where he got the name. And in The Truth, the person founding the paper comes to realize that it isn't that news happens and then it gets reported. Rather, something gets reported and that makes it news. So all of a sudden, rather than the, than the idea you have to find a worthy subject to write about, something important, something beautiful, you can just write whatever. And that made it beautiful. That made it worth reading. Now, obviously, this had a huge impact on the way art and literature were composed. Uh, this is where we get, in France, the roman feuilleton, which is a literary supplement. Um, you still get a lot of that even now. If you really want people coming back to your even website, you have to have more than just the one thing that you do. The more things that are going on, the more interested people are. And in this case, if you can get them hooked on a serialized story, you know, episode by episode. Uh, this is this is the early form of the, the kind of streaming TV shows we have now where you end up, I said we don't need these TV shows if they're online. Anyway, where you can't stop, right? There's like 10 seasons and you blow through all 10 seasons in a month. Binge watching, right? Only back then you had to wait for the next installment of the paper to find out what happened next. The picture you see behind you there uh, is The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Just a fantastic story. Uh, they've never made a good movie out of it yet. I don't think they ever will. But anyway, and everybody came back to buy more. And it worked brilliantly. The, uh, the stories usually occurred on the bottom half of the front page so that as soon as you walk up, you see, oh my gosh, there it is. There's the next part of the story. And you immediately snatch it up. Now, you can imagine what critics said. This is still coming out of an era when to write literature meant to write literature with a capital L or to paint, to compose art with a capital A. It had to be, it had to be big and important and address classical subjects. And all of a sudden, somebody's publishing something about, I don't know, a factory worker somewhere in Paris. And for most of the old guard, that is just not literature. Just not now, of course, the funny thing about this is how well it precedes the internet era. Uh, if you've ever read any of the criticism about blogs, blogging culture, for example, one of the common refrains is always like, well, I, the, the perfect quote, actually, the comedian Dennis Miller um, has remarked that never have lives less lived been more documented uh, with Snapchat, with Instagram, uh, Used to be blogs, but I guess those have kind of gotten old now. But anyway, this is not a new thing. Uh, as it says in the book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible, there is nothing new under the sun. 19th century, early 19th century, I forget the exact date, but they were already railing against daily papers in exactly the same terms. Um, I've been trying to find the quote, but I can't find it anymore. The French critic and literary scholar at the time, and himself a novelist, I believe, uh, saint Beuve remarked once that uh, basically, and I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of paraphrasing here, but basically that anyone can write anything. Next, The next thing you know, and I think this is an exact quote, the next thing you know, everyone is going to have their own paper because why not? They'll just go write about like, oh, look at the cake I had for my wedding. You know, That's the 1850s, right? We, we haven't come all that far. And that was just words. What happens when you bring photographs into things? It's one thing to be able to write about an occurrence, and people may have been there. It's a different thing entirely if they can actually see it. The historian Alexander Deforge, I don't think he actually pronounces that in the French way. That would be Deforge, but anyway. In Shanghai, when photographic pictorial journals came into print, it changed the way people thought about their city. We sort of take this for granted now. When we have everything from Google Maps to just our own cell phones, you can see whatever you want. But you can imagine you've lived in a city your whole life, you've looked around it, but now you have a photograph and there's hundreds of people in it. 
And there's photographs from all over the city. You can encounter them however you want, individually, all together. The face of the city changes. It's no longer just a thing that you walk through and look at yourself. It's a thing that you can browse through. You can see at a distance even. And you start flattening the landscape a little bit. Uh, Deforge also points out that before, images like this used to be the, the, the purview of the wealthy. I mean, you had, to, you had to have a lot of money to have even a painting. That was in China, but it's the same really. It was the same everywhere, right? If you, if you wanted a painting, you had to hire a painter or buy it from a painter. Now, you just grab the daily paper and there's, there's your image. There's the thing you're looking at. Now, it's interesting that because of this, the critics then and now tend to think mostly about the content of a piece that Dennis Miller quote. What he's angry about is that it seems like nothing actually happens and then people talk about it all the time. And it was the same thing in the mid-19th century. You had daily papers reporting, oh, uh, like in this picture here, there was a little show in a carnival. Okay, great, who cares, right? Um, but the th other thing that people don't really talk about very much is how it changed the, the actual interaction with the forms of art themselves, right? So for the first time, you've got all of these different kinds of media happening on the same page. You can read a poem, you can laugh at a joke, you can see a photograph, you can see a caricature without even turning the page. Used to be you had to physically go from place to place. If you want to see a photograph or a, a painting, you had to go to a museum. You want to read something in a book, you got to go to a bookshop to buy a book. And as you do that, you walk through the, the physical landscape of the city itself. That's an experience. Going to buy a book was a part of the reading process. Now, it's not. Now you walk out and you buy one thing and you can sit there all day and just look at it. Now the great German cultural critic and philosopher, and I'm going to pronounce this the way everyone in at least the academic circles I, I, I walk in pronounce it, which is Walter Benjamin. When I first got to grad school, I hadn't read him and I thought it was Benjamin, uh, especially because I don't speak German and it seemed kind of pretentious. But now I can't bring myself to say Benjamin, so Benjamin, he will stay. He wrote in the 1920s and 30s a lot about this aspect of human experience. And this is a quote, Even the most perfect reproduction of a work of art is lacking in one element, its presence in time and space, its unique existence at the place where it happens to be. And along with that, um, all the different experiences that come with it. Now, he calls this an object's aura, really sort of uh, maybe overly spiritual word. But basically what he's talking about is that aspect of an object that you just can't reproduce, right? If you've ever been to an art museum, a really famous one, a really beautiful one, there is something about the experience that you, you really can't talk about, right? You can say, oh, I saw this painting, here's what I was thinking, but that's still not exactly what the painting was, right? Uh, and this this is what he's mentioning, we're, we're losing this. If you can reprint, if you can reproduce something and circulate it in a daily paper, that's great. But the actual physical presence of the thing cannot be actually reproduced. Now, the reason that this is interesting is because there's a, there's a sense that when you do reproduce something and you can pick it up and look at it, like if you have a sort of a, a coffee table version of the great paintings of the Louvre, for example, you think, wow, I, just, I can look at these paintings whenever I want. That brings me closer to them. And Benjamin points out that the contemporary masses, as he calls them, have a desire to bring things closer, spatially and humanly, which is just as ardent as their bent toward overcoming the uniqueness of every reality by accepting its reproduction. Right, And so he qualifies the term closer because technically... When you're interacting with an image, you're not interacting with it. You're interacting with the newspaper that has printed it. And if you see a photograph, any sort of connection you feel, according to Benjamin anyway, is actually to the camera and to the photographer as much as to the image itself. Because there's a step, an even bigger step, between you and the thing depicted. Uh, if someone just gives you a photograph, uh, you can't just take one step and there you are. You're a couple of steps removed. Um, and there's also this desire, even then, to, to be brought closer to a thing, right? Everyone wants, you know, people who didn't have money might have really wanted to see the great artworks of the day, but couldn't. So this made them feel like they were a part of things. Now, 
I've put this image up here. This is a very, very famous painting by René Magritte um, in the 1920s that just says in French, this is not a pipe. Of course, you look at it and you think, well, yes, it is a pipe. Well, what he's getting at is, no, it's not a pipe. It's a painting of a pipe, right? And if you want to get really technical, it's not even just a painting of a pipe. It's an artist painting a picture of a pipe. So you're getting several different uh, steps of remove here. And this is a little bit what Benjamin is getting at, right? So great, we've painted a picture of a pipe. You can see a pipe, a painting of a pipe that looks as realistic as you can hope for, but it's not really the thing itself. Now, contrary to what you might think from that quote, Benjamin thinks this is a really good thing. Right, because in the past you had a very small minority of people who got to control everything to do with art and expression. So I decide what you read, I decide how it's read, and that's the way it is. Uh, we'll be talking about Chinese poetry, as I mentioned before in our first unit, but the Chinese state definitely dictated rules for how this worked. Um, there were ways to write a poem and read a poem. Uh, ways that you had to duplicate on an exam. And it was a little different in Europe, but not very different, right? Uh, and it was the same with painting, it was the same with sculpting, with music. Uh, but the moment you begin circulating things on a mass scale, all those rules sort of go out the window, right? Why should I write a poem the way you do? I can write whatever I want and put it in my own paper. Now, in addition, Benjamin writes, Originally, the contextual integration of art and tradition found its expression in the cult, i.e. religious cult, like a meeting. We know that the earliest artworks originated in the service of a ritual, first the magical, then the religious kind. The unique value of the authentic work of art has its basis in ritual. But in the modern age, for the first time in world history, mechanical reproduction emancipates the work of art from its parasitical dependence on ritual. That's a mouthful. But the idea is still a sound one. The, the, whenever you had an object in the past that had meaning, that people wanted to look at, it started out being a religious artifact. Uh, first magical, then religious. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with his, his progression there. But the idea is simply that um, they, they, they acquired meaning because of how they were used in a religious ritual or a magical ritual, if you like. Um, but now that they can be reproduced, they don't have to be included in that anymore. Anyone can acquire them. Now, interestingly here, there's another historian, Benedict Anderson, uh, whose book Imagined Communities is sort of the, the Bible for studies of the, the development of the nation state. Um, one of the things he points out is that, yes, a lot of these religious rituals sort of die out, especially as the church gets replaced by secular government in France in the late 18th century, but one thing does take its place, and that is the purchase of and reading of the daily paper. Reading the news becomes the new, as Hegel called it, the new church. There are new daily prayers, I believe he called them. So you got up, you got your paper, and you write it, which used to be up until the creation of the internet that, that held true, right? Everyone had a paper. That's what they did in the morning. They all did it together. And that's very much a kind of ritual. Now, you can probably already see some connections to the modern day. Uh, the digital age really is not a huge jump from what lithography and photography did. Uh, they're, they're doing something similar, just in a very different way. So whereas lithography and photography allowed us to take real things and put them onto paper, in the digital age, you can take pretty much whatever you want and put them on a screen. But... Benjamin's point about nearness and distance is no less interesting here. There's another German, it's not, it's not on purpose that they're all German today, I don't know why, but German thinker, Wolfgang Ernst or Wolfgang Ernst, I, I don't speak German, I feel, feel bad trying to pronounce it that way, but whatever. When you see a photograph or video online, he says, you're actually at several removes from the actual event, which seems paradoxical, right? Because you're like, I'm looking at the video of the thing, I'm, I'm right there, right? But what he mentions with the internet is, is what's being stored is not actually the video. It's, as he calls it, it's system of technological protocols, algorithms, uh, encoding, binary code. 
uh, all the, the, the very background stuff that none of us think about much, HTML, all the coding languages like that, um, are in play here. And that's actually what you're interacting with. So go back to this picture here. What you are looking at on the screen is not even a painting of a pipe. It is a digital reproduction of a painting of a pipe, right? Um, now, this sounds sort of circuitous, like, well, yeah, we know that, but who cares? Um, the important thing about this is that Benjamin and other critics like this go wrong in assuming that art has fundamentally changed in the process. Now, obviously, the kinds of art we're seeing look very, very different than they used to, right? But the, the focus, the, the, the basic idea of art has not, right? And here I'm using art sort of literary or otherwise. The painting you see in the background is Monet, and Claude Monet. Uh, in, in reality, art has always existed at the intersection of nearness and distance. So the painting of Monet in the background there is, it comes at a period when photography and science had all basically taken over what painting used to do. Um, and so the Impressionists who had their first Salon, their first exhibit in 1863, um, looked at what all the photography and scientific explanations were doing and went, you know, art has to do something different. Art has to preserve some sense of distance, right? And the two, nearness and distance, sort of have an obverse relationship. Uh, when one dominates, the other tends to take a balance, right? So Monet paints in an age when if you want to see a picture of a, of a water lily, you can go get you a photograph of a water lily. His painting is going to be the complete opposite of that. And conversely, there's a reason portraits and quote-unquote realistic painting were a big deal until the advent of photography. Because if you wanted to see a painting of Rembrandt, this is a painting self-portrait of Rembrandt, uh, you had to go to an art museum. That was the only way to see it. Now, the very nature of art... And by here, of course, I'm also mentioning literature, art and literature, stresses both nearness and distance at the same time. Uh, there's a reason you don't just say something like, I'm mad, right? Uh, if it's to be a poem or if it's to be a painting, something has to happen that makes you take a step back and see it, hear it differently. Art changes the experience fundamentally to bring you both closer and a little bit further away further away from the actual event, but perhaps closer to your experience of an event. Now, in this course, uh, we're going to be looking at precisely this effect, because more than any other experience, trauma cannot be easily related. If you've ever had a friend who's been some, through something really difficult, whether, whether sort of run-of-the-mill difficult or an actual traumatic event, Asking them to tell you about it is very hard because they can't just tell you the, the, the things that happened. Their own emotions are involved. Now, art is meant to facilitate that a little bit. Um, once you get up to the level of historical trauma, it seems nearly impossible. How, for example, could someone who survived the rape of Nanking by the Japanese possibly hope to explain to someone what that had been like? You can't. There's simply no direct way to do it. Distance is required. And yet, paradoxically, sometimes it's the distance that makes people feel connected. Because if you could be put as close as possible to the actual events, it would demonstrate to you just how big a gulf there is between you and the person who experienced it. Um, but if you're both connecting through a work of poetry or music or painting, that's something you can both experience together. And though the thing that's, that spurred the creation of that particular item might be different, your experience of it can be closely related. So our studies are going to try to bring us closer to an event and ask for personal reflections. I mentioned in the syllabus your individual responses. But they're also going to seek to give you a sense of distance by reminding you of the steps between you and the event. So we're going to be looking not at just at what something says, but how it says it. Okay, looks like we're going to be a little bit over on time on this one. I'm still figuring out how this is going to work. I'm going to get it down to 15 minutes or less every time. But you've got the gist of the course. Next week, we will be looking at 
the poetry of Dufu. You will have assignments posted online, ready to go. Um, I will do my best to have Zoom laid out so anyone who wants to join me in the kind of virtual office hours can do that. In the meantime, email me your questions. WeChat, not WeChat, that's the Chinese app. Uh, WhatsApp me any of your questions and we'll do our best to move forward.